Okay. And we're going to go back. Cool. All right. Hope you had a great weekend. I know I did. And it is Monday. This is day 12 of 30 days to 2500. If you're new here, welcome. And this is the deal Just before the question is answered. If you're new, this is how this program works. If you come between four and five, the days that the program is going, because it was every day, but that proved to be too much for many people. So it's Monday through Friday and the weekends you can catch up. So if you show up between four and five on the days that the webinar is going, it's free. You get the content. I hold nothing back. If you miss the hours of four and five, I have a group on Facebook. It's 30 days to 2,500 bucks. Um, group's been there since day one because I knew people wouldn't be able to make it. And the recorded sessions and the enhanced version of the program is now $99 per month or $300 lifetime. This will not be on YouTube and no point in the future will I be making this free. Just to let you know that. So currently now, oh, I should actually go back a few steps. What I've done is these group, this uh, the 30 day group is actually going to my online video platform. There's a group of people in Facebook and I'm going to kind of move people over. I should say that, but I will send out a link to anyone that is interested in signing. And currently there's 11 days already in the group already set up on that platform. And it will take you if you're doing the exercises two weeks or it just depends if you're a business owner you'll do it much faster than someone that has a job but people have made the the grand total now is and there's someone that beat rc and I'm, I'm shocked he's at 20 g's on day 11 then rc is at 16 then i've had someone that's at five then i people are taking this course and they're making money following the steps now let me really pause on that if you come in and you go through the course and you're like, let's go to day two, let's go to day three, as if it's some type of competition to get to the end real fast or otherwise known as the race to the bottom, this course will not benefit you. It will not benefit you at all. You are wasting your time by being here. If you do come and you do all of the exercises, you will benefit from this course. You will benefit from this course tremendously. So with that, let's jump into it. Another component of this is the days are linked together. There is a process and a methodology to bring you along. Like the first 10 days was pretty much a little boot camp. And we're going to get a little and it's going to get more. It's going to get more difficult. It's going to become tougher. And I know some people are like, wait a minute, the first 10 days were tough. No, that was nothing. Just wait, because we're on uh, we're into the third let the second leg of uh, 30 days so it's really going to go up so for those of you who were here before so that you get your money from your honey did you get that ten dollars were you able to do it did you make that happen were you able to sell that cup to your significant other or friend now the reason for this exercise is not what you think it's not about the ten dollars it's to make your mind open up to new ways of doing things. Yes, we are currently on the Internet and you're getting this information from the Internet. The problem is most people do not realize that 85 percent of commerce, transactions, deals, the exchange of money happens offline. So. If you learn how to do, and this is the thing, it, it's there's a there's a really snarky parallel. If you're a person that dates very well in real life, you know that guy or that gal that can go up and just chat to anyone that they desire. You take your skills online, it amplifies. If you suck in real life dating, the chances of you sucking on online dating and sucking on online businesses are pretty high. Not always. There's no. You know, I'm not going to say this is across the board true because there's always exceptions or different avenues to the rule. But typically, if you are really good offline, you will crush it online. So for many of you, this, you know, door to door selling, talking to friends, talking to strangers. This is very new to you, but it will increase and enhance your life in ways you can't even imagine. 
like I said, people are making money. You do the work, you'll see the results. I guarantee you, if you do the work, you will see the results. You will see more money in your life. You will see improved self-confidence. You will see a happier you. Because this course isn't just designed to make you money. The first and foremost part of this course is to make you a better person. When you become a better person, a beautiful thing happens. Better people come into your life on all levels. And many people try to solve the problem of, oh, my life sucks. My life is horrible. It's the world doesn't like me. No, the converse is you don't like yourself. You don't like yourself enough to improve yourself to make yourself better. Because when you start doing that, just think about it. Like, say if you're a person that was overweight and you lost a lot of weight and just Think about how people started to respond to you. Folks you didn't even know were cheering for you to, do, to lose more weight and do better. That's kind of how the world works. When you start to create positive energy within, within yourself, you will create positive energy in other people for you. Uh, this is one of the reasons that I don't get into YouTube and the Facebook wars anymore. I was stupid at one point. You know, I'm human. We all make mistakes. Mistakes are going to happen. And one day I just came up with this social media policy. Does my participation in this forum add value to my life or does it or does it add value to the forum or does it subtract value? And like 90 percent of the time, it's like I don't do anything because it is not adding value. And that's just my little thing. But understand when you work on yourself and you follow the rules and some of this stuff is going to seem extremely weird. It's going to be very unsettling. It's going to be like, huh? It's going to make you go, What? But if you do it, you will be successful. Oh, these are some of the people <laughs> like Daniel. He's like he's added 500 bucks. Uh, James, he's added 800 bucks. Now, these are people who've all had their own businesses. Uh, I thought this was really good with Kathleen because it took her back to some things that her father taught her. Because this is the thing. Oh, things change, but some things don't change. Being a good person will always get you more out of life than being not so good person. And, you know, she's just like going through this and her dad gave and this man was able to be a traveling salesman and support the family from his ability to tell stories and to relate, interact with people. This is powerful stuff. What set my life on fire was Earl Nightingale, Lead the Field and The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. These books the books and the stuff was created in the 30s and the 40s. And it was able to help me in the early, the late 90s and early 2000s. So timeless classical ideals don't become outdated. You, that's another thing. It's like people are looking for the latest and greatest, the most uh, efficient and quickest way to success. And sometimes the most efficient and quickest way to success is hard work over a long period of time. Sad. I know because people are like looking for magic jelly beans, but I'll tell you, there will be a magic jelly bean in this. There will. If you're new, get ready because we do this every day. I need your word. I pledge to make myself better today than I was yesterday. Day by day, I will become the hustler I know I can be. I am all in. You have to prime your mind, your attitude, and your spirit for success. Sitting around hoping for success or hoping that the world changes to suit you is wasting your time and making you miserable. This was another task from uh, day 11. Did you tell your story? Because the thing is, I get this on YouTube. It's like, Glendon Cameron's a storyteller. He's a good storyteller. And what people don't understand is storytelling is communication at a higher level. Everyone here has a song, a movie, a certain book that was fictional, maybe nonfiction, but it told a story in a manner to you that just captivated you, just took you to another place and you'll never forget it. Like my favorite book of all time is The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. It's an awesome book. It's a long book, but it transported my thinking to a different place. When in this, when you have those kind of stories, they can move you to a different ability a different perspective so don't really poo poo storytelling because if you haven't noticed marketing has changed 
if you go to the razor commercial with the guy the dollar shave club his commercial is a story of how his business came to be he talks about the economy he talks about his papa he talks about his business it's a story and it's done and produced in such a manner that the his commercial went viral another thing you'll find here is you have to think fast um this is one of the tasks. And if, you, if you're if you new, once again, this is about action. This isn't about sitting here watching these presentations and just soaking it in and waiting for the next one. Every day, there's something you must do. So you're going to find a stranger and tell them about your business this week. Pitch the stranger, sell to the stranger. If your product or service is of no use to that person, and there's times that they really don't have a use for what you have, you're going to get a referral. Because if you pitch them right and they like you, they will open their referral network to you. Now, I'm going to tell you a very interesting story about this. When I was in contract office furniture and there was about a six month period where I hit salesman of the month. And the guys in the office was like, well, Jim is giving Glendon all the good leads. And to a degree, that was kind of true. And the reason Jim was giving me leads because I was closing shit. <laughs> <laughs> he was giving me some good stuff, but it wasn't the leads that he gave me that enabled me to be the salesman of the month six months in a row. It was referrals. It was 100 percent referrals because I'm going to give you the methodology of the contract office furniture business. Sometimes you'll get someone that has immediate needs. But typically, if you do not get to that client before they think about moving or they're in the process of relocating, because that's what makes them say, hey, we're going to take the furniture we have or if we're expanding, we're going to buy all new stuff. There's a lot of decision making that goes on long before they even hire the mover. You have to get in there really, really early. So. Our lead times could be anywhere from a year to about an average four months, five months, because typically if I didn't get in, if they had already hired a mover, I was about 10 steps behind because they had made a lot of decisions already. And there was already a furniture guy in there. Sometimes you can get in there on a pricing game or you can go in and be like, a, you know, just a, a disruptor and go in there and bomb the price. Don't make any price, but just to cause your competition pain did that a lot. But when I would go to a client and I was in good stead and I got that first check, I would say even before the project was done, I know people are like, well, wait until you do a good job. No, no, no. Do it while they like you. And I was like, um, do you know of anyone else in this building that may be moving or, you know, you have close relationships to, you know, because the thing is, there's what's called a cold call and there's what's called a warm knock. When you can say Jim referred me to you, a lot of resistance is gone. So I would make those calls and most of the time, 90 percent of the time, it was just chasing nothing because it's like, yeah, we thought about moving, but they hadn't made any firm commitment. But that 10 percent was gold because I remember when I helped move um, this company, Nagel, something, 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 because it was not a law firm. It was a insurance financial firm. And I got in and I sold them two partner desks because they promoted two people to partner. And I was in that office so many times that I was talking to the receptionist and I was like, do you know anyone else in this building is moving? And she said, yeah, the first, the top floor, because I have lunch with their girl. She's like, yeah, they're talking about it. But she's like, you know, they've got some issues. And I was like, what's her name? You know, just just you never know who has information in these situations. You never know. You never know. So I was like, well, when are you going to lunch? Oh, well, in a little bit. Well, I'll tell you what, get your girlfriend and we'll, I'll take you out to lunch. So I took her to lunch and everything, took him to a nice place because uh, this place was close to Rays on the River, which is kind of like, you know, right on the Fulton County, Cobb County line. And we're sitting there just talking and she's like, yeah, you know, it's like my boss is stressed because they want him to do this. They want him to do this. His budget is tight, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, this this information was freaking gold because I was in there early. So after I took him to lunch, I went up. And I was like, you know, tell your boss my name and tell him I can help him. Tell him I can be a resource to him for his biggest problem right now. And she said, oh, God, you know, I'll get you in today. So I go in there. The guy doesn't know me, but I'm walked in by his receptionist. And she said, hey, I was going to lunch with Natalie. And, you know, and this guy, he, he sells furniture and stuff. And I was in his office for three hours. They didn't even talk to anybody else. It was a four hundred thousand dollar deal for my company. 
with a company I was working for because I didn't do that with no own. And it was that kind of communication and pitching strangers and talking to people that opened the door. Will this always result in money? No, it will not. Most of the time, it will not result in money. You'll just be talking to a lot of people and building a network of good influence. But that's how I got one of the biggest deals on the hump. I didn't have to really do any work. I didn't have, the guy was like totally stressed. He was just like sweating bullets. When I told him like, well, you know, what kind of phone system do you have? I was like, well, they can actually add to that. You don't have to get a new phone system. You may have to increase the module. And it just the fact that I was just like solving problems at his desk. He was like, got on the phone, uh, called his boss. I mean, like I said, they didn't talk to anyone else. I got that total deal, 100% lock, stock, and bottom. Uh, I brought in the movers, and uh, they gave me some commission off their deal. It was just beautiful. It was totally beautiful. So that's what can happen when you talk to strangers. All right, we're on day 12, creating your own economy. Now, this is going to be a little different because day one through 11 was just one one day you know some of these things these concepts that i'm gonna bring to you are gonna be like a day or two maybe even three just depending and creating your own con economy is so big i can't give it to you in one day so i'm just going to give you the first part because i think it's very very important i have a youtube video about this creating your own economy because essentially that's what we did with the storage auction business we were able to create an economy that was independent of the larger economy because understand our best years 2006 2007 2008 2009 what happened the economy was melting down our business boomed if we hadn't you know francine hadn't gotten cancer and i hadn't gotten sick you know 2010 2011 would have been great years too so when you build your own economy and you start talking to strangers and you build your list and you have your own economy the world can be literally falling apart and you can still make money and take care of your family and yourself. That is the power of building your own economy. And the first step is to pick a number, any number. All right. So just for illustration purposes, the number is twenty five dollars. Not a lot of money, right? You blow more than that going out to the movies with the wife and kids. Actually, you go to one movie with kids. You might be at 50, 60. Say you want to make hundred thousand a year. Let's deconstruct a hundred thousand a year. You got your tw number of twenty five. So how many twenty five dollar items do you need to sell to make a hundred thousand gross revenue? That's four. It's four thousand. You need four thousand products to make a hundred thousand in gross revenue. Now this is, seems extremely elementary, right? It seems so simple. This the lack of this kind of math is the reason that people get into sixty, hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars student loan debt. They never look at the numbers. They look at the possibility of what the degree may get them, but they never ever look at the numbers. Because <clears throat> if they look at the numbers, their hair would fall out of their head, and that's like, whoa, I don't know about that. Many businesses do the same thing. I am notorious for walking into a business and just looking at how they're set up and like, oh, they're not going to be here in six months because they didn't look at the numbers and the way that they have their stuff set up uh, the price points it shows because <clears throat> i learned this lesson from danny at the uh, latonia flea market i was setting up my first booth and i had all kinds of stuff in there and he comes by and he doesn't really say much but it's one of the most important lessons of my life he says i walk i looked at your booth you know everything that you got in there added up doesn't even cover half your booth rent you know that right and he walked off <laughs> you just walked off and I started thinking if I sell everything in here I am still halfway behind the eight ball so I sat down and I was like okay and I had my truck with me so I went to the truck and I pulled out some furniture so I put in a dresser that I got at Candler Road Storage I remember that dresser because that auction was always weird and I put 80 bucks on the dresser I put in a hat rack for 25 then an edergé, which is a fancy name for bookshelf or with glass and stuff. So those items came up to about 250 Booth rent was 150 Left that in there. And I still had all the other stuff in there. Went back the next day. All of the stuff that I had put in there was gone. Booth rent was paid. <clears throat> and I had a profit. 
And it's very simple and it's very elementary, but many people don't do this. They get caught up in business cards, LLCs, color schemes, talking to Boo Boo the Fool. They get caught up in all this stuff and they never, ever look at this stuff. And that's why so many businesses go out of business. They never look at this stuff. They never pick a number. They never claim a number. All right. Now, let's say the number is 350. We want to, once again, make $100,000. It's a way different ball game because you're like 3,714 items less to get to the same gross revenue. And this is one of the things that I want to teach you is like you've got to really look at these numbers. You have to look at scalability because this is the beginning of you creating your own economy because say you're an explorer, right? And if too many degrees, you are an explorer in the business world and you chart this new land. What are you going to do with no plan for committing, creating a community, no schools, no banks, whatever? It's just going to be anarchy. It's going to be chaos. All right. Now, this is uh, this is the question for you. The number is a mill. That's one million dollars. How do you get there? Is it twenty five dollar items, three hundred and fifty dollar items? Which one? What are you going to do to get there? And to help you out while you're thinking and writing down your final answer, I'm going to play the Jeopardy music. Doom, 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 doom. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that to you because I know some of you are just like, I'm getting out of here. But I really just think about it for a second. Which number do you need to get to a million? Which one are you going to pick? The truth of the matter is any number will do. It's all about your infrastructure. See, the number is important, but what's more important is your infrastructure. Say you've got great products, right? So you can sell them for 500 bucks and you're working out of your house and you can only have 20 of these items in your house. So even though you have a great market, you can sell these as soon as you get them. Your infrastructure is the bottleneck, not the price point, not the market. Many people make this mistake when they do <clears throat> excuse me, an eBay business, an Amazon business. I have told so many people that it is time for you to get out of the house because the efficiencies and scalability will increase tenfold when you get out of the house. The house is cozy and it's nice and it's wonderful, but it's a limited infrastructure. And what you do is you create a limited job for yourself. You will never be able to go any further. We had to get out of the house because it was well, we got knocked on by neighbors. That was part of the problem. But when we started growing, the money started growing. So your infrastructure is number one, the most important thing. And then your number. So mm -hmm. you create an infrastructure that can scale. Then you, you, you're open the door to many beautiful possibilities. But when you just continue to ignore your infrastructure and focus 100 percent on the numbers, you're going to be perpetually frustrated. You, you're just not going to go as far as you can with your business. Because, you know, the infrastructure and your numbers, that's that's the foundation of this. That's the foundation of creating your own economy. That's the foundation of building your own world, because. That's like the nucleus. Once you get that stuff together, then you can add the community, the banks, the church, the schools and all these other things if you want to. And when I say the banks, you know, <coughs> excuse me, in many states, you could create your own credit union. You get 50 people together and y'all charter that sucker. And you create your own credit union, create your own bank and loan money to each other. You can do that. Create your own school. Many, many people are homeschooling. And this kind of goes back to creating your own economy because if you can make an economy that pays you where you don't have to work a regular job, you can stay home and teach your kids. So this is what I'm talking about, because when you look at what's going on in the world, many people are being indoctrinated not to think. And it creates some very dangerous situations. But that's a whole nother webinar. But when you get your foundation together. Because understand what you're building, if the foundation is weak, I don't care how much venture capital you get. I don't care who comes in. I don't care what great products. It will implode at some point because the infrastructure cannot handle it. 
build the biggest infrastructure that you can and then the profits will be bigger and more lasting and more sustainable as long as you keep your infrastructure small weak and inefficient you will reflect that in the money that you make another part of creating your own economy is ownership and this is a big one this is a very large concept this is a scary concept do you own your life? Why don't you think about that? <clears throat> Do you own your life? And they're going, yeah, I own my life. Hell yeah, I own my life. I'm my own woman. I'm my own man. I got this down. Really? Let's 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 explore. Let's let's discuss. You own stuff. You have a phone, a car, a home. You have bills. What's missing? your life <laughs> if you cannot quit your job and not suffer dire consequences and i'm not saying just quit your job you know i don't recommend anyone to quit their job before they have income to replace that job you don't own your life <clears throat> you don't own it you you do not own your life and that's where creating your own economy comes into and it's not about the money it's about freedom it's about, you know, one of my biggest tenets is manage your money or your money's going to manage you. Once you start managing your money, then you can start managing your own economy. And it doesn't take a lot. Now, one of the biggest things and one of the biggest lies is you need a million, you need two million, you need three million to retire. I saw people in my neighborhood. Now, granted, they had pensions. It makes a difference. That had no, never had that kind of money, but they did something very wise. They bought one house, didn't move, paid it off in 10 or 15 years. I knew someone, they had a mortgage party, 10 year mark, house was paid off in 10 years, never moved. The wife went on to become a nurse. He started a business. They still stayed in that house. They could have easily got something else, but their money was theirs. Cars paid off, houses paid off. If you can get to a point where your car is paid off and your house is paid off, you are 50 percent retired. You are 50 percent retired because that is what keeps most people. Part of being owned versus owning. Going back to um, my YouTube video and discussion about owning a home, I got a lot of blowback on you know, home ownership, this home ownership. I know this is going to sound crazy. There's a lot of people who really don't want to own a home. The only reason they buy a home is because they're told it's a good thing to do. And we're going to get real deep with that. Have you ever watched the news and watched some unfortunate event of someone that their home, it was burnt down. Something happened, destroyed by a tornado, something really horrible. And you see the distress and the angst of these people. And I'm not going to piss on their misery and saying, oh, you know, they shouldn't have bought the home. But what I'm trying to illustrate is that when you put so much of your life into a thing that can be taken away from you by an act of God or an act of man. Do you really own it? Yeah, you have insurance, maybe because insurance companies may not pay it to have it rebuilt. So you've put all of this stuff into this thing you don't own. Like when my books, I own those. I could take them anywhere I want to. I could sell them to whoever I want to. I actually own those. So you can own a concept. You can own an ideal. You can own a process. These things are worth owning. Now, if you're going to get into the real estate game and if you go into the real estate game as a owner, i.e. you buy a piece of property that you're going to rent to someone else. OK, that's creating your own economy. That is creating your own economy. But putting yourself in crazy hawk for one house because this is just my thoughts. If you have the ability to buy a million dollar home, but you didn't take that million and buy a piece of commercial product property, I think you're an idiot. That's just my opinion. One man's opinion. I mean, people will differ because if you took that one million and bought a piece of commercial property, it grows up in value and it produces cash for your kids and for your grandkids. Whereas the home could become a liability. It can become a money pit. You have to, because if you didn't know every 30 years, you need to replace the wiring. That may have been extended to 50. So a lot of these older homes that people are selling because they're moving out, you have to gut them. So there's a lot to more to just, you know, the home thing. And I'm saying that because, you know, I've kind of changed up the 50 laws of power. And one of the laws is don't build a, a kingdom in a thimble 
That's what you do when you get a home and you put everything in that home and you build nothing else. I've seen people console people who were just like so destroyed when that happened because they built nothing else. Same thing when you put all your stuff into your kids and they like say, we don't like you anymore. You got to put stuff, you know, if you want to get a home, get a home. I'm not saying don't get one, but I'm saying don't make it the be all of your life. You want kids? Have kids. Love them. Enjoy them. Bring them up right. Don't let them be the be all of your life. Have some type of balance because have you ever noticed how many couples get divorced once the kids are gone? They've been miserable for years. They were just waiting for the kids to leave so they can finally vamoose. I think that's a horrible way to live. And it also teaches your kids a lie. So, you know, that's enough of the social soapboxing. But the thing is, owning your life is owning your time. It's owning what you do and being happy with who you are. And these are all intrinsic values that have nothing to do with stuff. When I was in the storage auction business, I was in a rare, rare, rare position that most of you will never, ever be in. So I'm, I, it's going to be, and I'm not trying to be in delicate or impolite. It's very hard to understand that when in a year you have three and four dining room tables, within a year you have 15, 20 brand new wardrobes. You just put stuff up on eBay because you're tired of wearing it. I got my fill of stuff on an accelerated rate. To the point I don't have stuff thirst, if that makes any sense, because I'm desensitized to it. You know, there's certain things I like and I'll get them, but I don't need a lot of stuff in my life because I've had a lot of stuff. And when you've experienced it and you look at it and go, oh, this is what this is. You have a greater understanding. Now, if you're on the outside of that conundrum and you've never had enough stuff and you've always lived in a state of lack and a state of poverty. And when I say poverty, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about middle poverty, because if you see someone that is successful and you look downward or you start feeling bad about yourself, you are in a state of mental poverty. I don't care what's going on in your life. If you can look at someone that has a beautiful moment and be happy for them, you're living in mental poverty because what you're looking at, their happiness means that, you know, you lost something. And that's not really the truth. That's mental poverty. And that is one of the things that happens when you don't own your life. So start creating your own economy, putting together these principles is a great way for you to move forward. And this is the part about becoming happy and becoming a better person, because you have become extremely happy and just have two coins in your pocket. Because the, the most of the work has to be done on the inside. It's not like, you know, retail therapy, just going shopping to make yourself feel better. That's just a temporary fix. But when you get to the root of your unhappiness, and for many people, it's going to be different, different reasons. And you solve that issue, you're going to become real happy. You know, waking up every day is going to be fun. Going out is going to be fun. Going to Target with your kids, your wife or whatever. That's like a joyful experience because you, you're bringing happiness with you versus you going out looking for it. So that's the whole thing about owning your life. When you really, really own it, a lot of this material stuff goes away. So the reason I'm cheesing, I'm cheesing because I own my life. Uh, I will say for the first time I own my life. I started about 2008. I was freer than most people, but writing that first book created a perspective and a situation that made me look at my life. It's like, wow. So 2008 to now is the period that I've owned my life. So it's a relatively short period of time that I've really owned my life. I've been, like I said, better off than a lot of people, but like owning my life and having control of my time. That's relatively new. And since I've gone through this process recently, I can relate to you the things to do where you can get to this point much quicker than I did. Because, you know, I fell for the Kool-Aid. I drank the Kool-Aid. I, no, I drank the picture of Kool-Aid about you got to get this car. You got to get this house. You got to get this. This. No, you don't. You kind of sit down and say, well, what do I want? And what what is happiness for me? And when you start answering those questions, it's going to be different stuff for different people. You're going to start to look remarkably dissimilar from your neighbor and your family, which will bring some uh, dissension. <laughs> All right. Now, here's the magic jelly bean. I actually don't own much in my life. And this by a choice. Uh, I got rid of a lot of stuff. Uh, after my partner died, a lot of stuff just wasn't really, really important to me. 
But see, this is the rub. I do control many things. There's a lot of stuff I don't know. I don't know on YouTube. I control a part of it, you know, due to, you know, the, the way things are. And it's a quid pro quo relationship. If I wasn't putting up videos to get enough traffic, they wouldn't do the things they do for me. So I don't own it, but I control it. And I got a lot of control with YouTube. I don't know Facebook, but I control a part of it. So going through the process of owning stuff and then going through the process of owning my life, I learned that I don't need to own stuff to benefit from them. As long as I can control them and I have a great deal of autonomy, I can do well. Now, with the way that the world is going with websites and stuff, you can own a website. But the thing is, if you don't own Google or have a some control of Google, Unless you have a huge mailing list, no one's going to know where it is. That's why I laugh. Uh, recently today, I had someone had copied six of my videos and put them on their channel, right? And keyworded them properly. They had no views. Only reason that I knew was they popped up in my video feed because they keyworded them right and they were popping up with my videos. But even they had been up about four days and they still had no views. So just because you can get the right information, just because you can get on the platform, it still isn't going to help you if you don't do the rest of the work, which goes back to building that foundation. So what I'm finding is control is uh, is more important than ownership. Way more important. Now, think fast. Yes, the bullet is back tonight. I want you to write up your life number. Whatever it may be. This is the number that frees you. It may not be a million. It may be, and when I say numbers, what will it take you to be free from what's holding you back right now? Say you got a mortgage. If your mortgage was gone and your car payment was gone, what could you do with your life? Think in those terms. What is your number? What money do you need to free you? And it's not going to be a million. Now, if you want a million, go for it. If you want two million, go for it. If you want 20, go for it. Write it down. But think about the things that you need, the money you need that will free you. And when you come up with that number, times it times two. And uh, that's your goal for tonight. That's your task for tonight. The first task was for this week, but it may take some time. But this is for tonight. Okay. So I didn't get the speech, but typically I do the presentation. And if you have a question... I will answer. All right. And there's always interesting commentary when I get into this. Carmen. Hey, just wanted to share. I finally got off my lazy butt and took action this weekend. I grossed $714. I would have never got motivated to get moving rather than thinking about doing. Okay. See, this is what I'm talking about. All right. What's the, what's the name of this? 30 days to 200 and 2500 bucks. She's a little bit, almost a third of the way there in one weekend. $714. That's a new number to put on the list. Congratulations, Carmen. Because, see, this is the thing. And that's why this course is designed this way. Because, you know, I've been doing this for three years. And I've noticed that, you know, give out great information, but people don't do anything with it. I even had a conversation with someone I ended up had to threaten with a copyright lawsuit about this. Uh, Richard, tell $20,000 I'm coming for. <laughs> I knew you would be. Uh, Michael, Glendon, I love the story you told about the man who was really in charge at the meeting. My question is, how did you get to the economic buyer, economic buyer, a.k.a. the man with the money? In the beginning, I had no clue to who really made decisions. I would just listen to people and like, well, that's the guy you need to talk to. Part of it is I took a course on body language. I know it's kind of strange, but I started to kind of feel that this wasn't the guy or the girl because one quick way is to start asking them very hard questions. Like, if I give you what you want, can you make a decision today? And then they start like, hmm, hmm. no, they ain't the guy. Because the guy will say, look, I'm not ready to make a decision. And then sometimes you just have to straight up say, are you the person who's going to make a decision for this project? Because if they can't, you're wasting your time. And, you know, it seems rude, but you could talk to someone for three weeks. And if they can't make a decision, you've wasted three weeks. 
Uh, Betty, you're so right about Lee DeField. I got the CDs and listened to him during the car during my commute. I've implemented some things and things changed. I used my tools like this when I was younger and I know why. I've gotten so far in my life, but I'm not living my dreams. You definitely have uh, to change your head before you make any progress. And HU is included. Yeah, your mindset's everything. Mindset is definitely everything. Hello, Susan. Uh, Dwayne. Uh, Dwayne, is this a decent analogy? Control versus ownership. A renter can control their apartment while the owner does the maintenance. That's a good question. It's, I want you to think about what you want. Now, the premise for this is what do you want? Because I know a guy who's worth 30 million and he rents. Now he owns several commercial properties, but where he lays his head with his wife and kids, he rents because he thinks a house is a terrible investment. So just something to think about, because it really goes back to what you want. Like I said, if you want to own a house, go for it. But if you want to be free, you want to travel, you want to do certain things, a house can actually hinder many things that you want to do. Uh, Chris, my area's Craigslist is pathetic and the nearest flea market is exactly one hour away. Can you recommend different sales strategies? Okay, you, you kind of answered your own question. You've actually given me some really good information. Your Craigslist is pathetic and there's no decent flea market, which means you can start one. What you can do is start your own flea market, use Craigslist, and use the title, the only decent flea market in this area. When you have a problem, realize that everyone in your area has a problem. Uh, the way, hey, thanks for helping me connect with my teenage son. I was selling him lumber, two by fours, for a customer's job while we rode in the van. He got so tickled that a teenager for a brief moment thought dad was cool. But what passes for cool was old man. I, that's awesome, man. That's an awesome story. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Susan, do you mean the number annually or monthly? Also, did you at least 50 more, four more, let's see, hold on. Also, did at least 50 more percent this week in sales than usual? Some say it was weather. I say it was because of your motivation. I, I'm going to say this. There's two times a business does really, really well when the business opens and when the business closes. And the reason is when you open, you have a plan, you market and you focus. Then after a while, you just kind of start coasting. And then when you close, you want to get as much money out of that because a lot of people, when they close their business, that's what refunds their, their funds, their retirement. So they're very focused. You can make money. 12 months out the year. And every year, every month, your income can grow if you're marketing right. So if you put in your mind that you're going to make money, you're going to make money. So I think you put it in your mind. I agree with you. Uh, Manny, I'm trying to buy and sell on Craigslist using furniture because I did it in December and it sort of worked. But I was sort of sidetracked. Uh, side Any tips? You have to stay on it. Furniture is a weird animal. This is what you're facing. You're trying to sell something really expensive have a period where a lot of folks are broke which is typically after christmas not everyone is broke but a lot of people are broke you've got to kind of learn like furniture furniture can be seasonal you can sell accessories in the off-peak times because it, it also depends on what you're what you're spending for your furniture how much how cheap you're selling it because you know, typically january february and march for furniture not other stuff because other stuff rocks and rolls you have to be really cheap or you have to have stuff that's really, really nice. Chris, you're right. Old friend died, 53 years old, wife, one kid, seven years old, million dollar home, nice cars, best of the best for him and the family. He passed recently. He put everything into the house. He had nothing. Left the widow with $85 in the bank and hundreds of thousand dollars in debt. Needless to say, I was shocked and yes, no life insurance. You know how common that happens, how often that happens, because in our society, a house and a nice car is the be all be all. I actually had a chick stop dating me because I lived in an apartment. I'm not I'm not bullshitting you. It's like, it's like, you know, for someone your age, you should have a house. I'm telling you, that house thing is strong and it's part of culture indoctrination because when you really start thinking about, and you know, I, I feel bad for you, his wife, because 
her only thing she can do is file bankruptcy. You know, she'll probably get his social security benefits, but he was, you know, that commercial where the guy was on his lawnmower and he's smiling, but he's like, I'm in eyeballs up to my debt. That's very, very common. And it is, it's funny. I just had my physical for my life insurance because I'm increasing it just a few weeks ago. It seems to take, because I'm using USA, it's like four week process because I keep looking at it every day because the, I mean, it's, it's like super cheap, but a lot of people don't do that, man. They really don't do that. David, when you decided that you wanted to move on from a house, did you blow things out fast or did you do it in the time that was scheduled or slower? I had a huge, huge, huge estate sale. Put it on Craigslist and said, everything must go. I sold the paintings and stuff off the walls. I had one lady buy my whole dining room set. She bought the chandelier, the table, and the mirrors and everything on the wall. She bought everything. Five Gs. I had the, it went on for seven days. I made 12 grand. It was the estate sales of all estate sales because I knew that I was going to move. Actually, I was thinking about leaving Georgia and I just knew from being in the storage auction business so long that I've seen people pay for stuff three and four times over. And when I say that is you spend like five grand for furniture and stuff and put it in storage and you leave it in there for six years. You're paying like two twenty four hundred dollars a year, right? It stays in there three years. It stays in there four years. You've paid for that stuff three and four times. And that kind of goes back to picking the number and doing the math and adding up and makes what sense. But emotional attachment is strong, which is the deal with the house. Emotional attachment to the house is extremely strong because the house represents security. But if that sucker ain't paid off or you have some serious cash flow to make sure that it's always paid off, it's not security. It can actually be the thing that drowns you. Oh, this is from Jasmine. Whatever happened. Um, Dude moved out this weekend. I was going to put that in the video. He said, fuck it. Uh, they had a big fight. They saw the video. They got mad and he moved out and he rented an apartment. He told me he did the math. He said, even if she comes after him hard, it's still going to be way cheaper than sending that kid to William and Mary. Kind of had a feeling that was going to happen. Uh, Chris. I have attempted contacting local officials regarding necessary permits for opening a flea market, but the person I need to speak to was never available for two weeks straight. Any advice with dealing with hard to reach local officials? Open the flea market and they'll come find you. <laughs> this is what you do. Document. If you didn't do it by email, do it by email and do it by registered letter. Certified return receipt. Go ahead and do that whole process and document it. And when they don't get back to you, go ahead and open up the flea market. So you might open it because if they're that lazy, they may never have to come after you and you might be totally underground. I'm just saying. But no, go ahead and try to reach them. But see, this is the thing. You have to prove that you tried to reach them just because she's like, yeah, I called them. That's not going to work in court or if they come after you. But if you like in due diligence, try to reach them and they don't respond, they, they probably won't mess with you because they'll be embarrassed. And also going back to this course, you know, before you do the permits and everything, open it up on a small scale. See how it goes. Remember my friend with the cookie business? She was in business six months before she incorporated. OK, so that seems to be the last of the questions I will hold on because sometimes they like come in groups. But. As we go forward, is this is going to intensify because some of the things that are coming are more sales oriented type stuff because the first half was to get you moving, and the the, the you know the, the second leg is to get your sales process up because you can have resources, you can have money, but if you do not understand how to sell, you can still go out of business. Um, let me check and see if there's. Sure, sure thing, Chris. Um, the, the guy, the tale of Johnny Cox, this guy that came out to the storage auction uh, trail, somebody in his family had died and he had seven figures. He was wearing our asses out. And there was this guy. I can see his face. I can't remember his, of his name. Uh, he actually died a few years ago. And he gathered us around. I mean, talk about social media. And he said, there's this new guy named Johnny Cox. He's got a lot of money. And if you care about your business, we need to band together and wear his ass out because when he's around, you're not going to buy anything, but we need to make him pay for everything. 
And um, we saw him and, you know, at first people was like, uh, yeah, whatever. And then we saw him and the guy was buying everything. So I just stepped up and one unit I knew he wanted, I went out, I, I just said $2,000 and he went 2,500. I went three and it went like that all day. In six months, he was broke. Six months, he was broke. And the thing is, since he was one man, we created networks and it's like, is Johnny over there? No, he ain't over there. And we go to the auctions. I mean, I'm telling you. So having a lot of money with no experience on the environment that you're operating in can be deadly. And he came back about three years after we ran him off. He was more humble and actually he knew what he was doing at that point. He made more money after he lost the money than he did when he had that seven figures. Uh, David, how do you fight back commitment bias and stuff you spend a lot of time and money in? Um, do the Ben Franklin close in reverse. Ben Franklin is you take a graph, you take a T, you write a T on a sheet of paper and you put the cons and pros on it. So whatever you're working on, you con it and pro it out. And if the cons are larger than the pros, it's got to go. Uh, Cody, thanks for recommend, recommending Daniel Pink. Amazing books. I bought them all. Daniel knows his stuff. I love that guy. So typically it's 451. I will wait a few more minutes for any questions. I'll let you know, I'll be back again tomorrow at between four and five. And um, I'll send out the link for the groups tomorrow because I try to keep it to one email a day because, you know, today I sent out two emails because um, there was this thing about Amazon and I, I just felt compelled to share it as to, with as many people as possible because we're heading into this arena where uh, many people are going to be blindsided. Technology is moving so fast that we're going to have this period where a bunch of people are going to get displaced from their good job and they're not going to see it coming. And they're going to be out here fighting with other folks. But you guys are going to be ahead of them because, you know, I, I, like there's a group of people. Let's see. Let me see if there's a question. Uh, thanks for the boost. Without A day without motivation is like living normal. Tired of the normal. Dwayne. Karen, you're welcome. Uh, Chris, is there a way to sign up for every day of the webinar instead of sign up for one day at a time? Actually, there is, and I didn't do that for a reason. I've been doing webinars for years, and I've noticed that when I, people sign up in advance, the attendance is way lower. They forget or something happens. If you have to sign up every day, you're coming every day. And I know it's a pain, but the fact that a lot of people got bumped just kind of shows the commitment because we have only 18 more days. And like I said, we're not doing weekends anymore. Uh, it was called Dildo in the Brown Box. I didn't say anything about Amazon. You should have got it if you're on the list. But the um, the deal is with what's going on in the world is a lot of folks are, you know, you guys are going to be ahead. And you're going to be able to build some stuff. Because one of the reasons I created this course is I feel that in five years, it's going to be mandatory for a lot of people. Because what's happening is, Folks don't investigate stuff like, you know, with the Amazon thing I put out. There's 60 year old women working in an Amazon shipping dildos. Working in that warehouse for Amazon. I want you to think about that. Grandma is shipping dildos. Kind of going back to what um, someone said about the guy with the big million dollar house. He died and he left the family with nothing. Uh, since women historically used to because if you look at the research women are not living longer than men anymore since women are taking on the stressors that men have had for years they're dying off just as quick people are living on a stacked future it's a very very fragile thing that's going on so what's happening is you're going to have a huge flux of people i'm going to say 45 to 55 in the next five years are going to hit the world with no marketable job skills and they will be forced to start a business to survive. Uh, Jasmine, do you think market being flooded has any effect on how well you can do in the said market? Uh, definitely. Uh, it's going to kill your price points. If there is more inventory available than buyers, yeah, it's going to be huge. Uh, Chris, it happened yesterday at a Loki Pepsi plant. People showed up for work 
told you leave the building no warning nothing no layoff nothing this is, i'm telling you because especially with these fortune 500 companies they are working on uh, technological advancements and it, on like you wouldn't believe going back to that movie minority report you will see many factories like that in the next 10 years where there will not be a lot of humans in these factories Uh, I, David, I think you're right. The, those picker jobs, as soon as they can get a better system, yeah, they're going to be gone. They need them right now, but at some point, they're going to get rid of them. Does, uh, does grandma get a discount? Who knows? Yeah, I know they're using those Kiva robots. Uh, Jelani, I was looking to assist people in creating business because of the fact so few new jobs being created. I mean, it's going to be a growth market, man. The, from what I looked at, and this is just me using my research. I could be wrong, but I'm betting the farm on it. Dwayne, yep, there's a McDonald's nearby with an elderly guy working there. You can tell he's not for the joy of it. He's working to pay bills, lay our effects of the future for anyone without a plan. This is true. Daniel, most of my customers contact me through text message to my Google Voice. It's just a regular Excel spreadsheet, the best way to collect numbers for my list. Whatever works for you, because I haven't done it yet, but there's going to be, there's already systems in place where you can like shoot out mass text and stuff. And there's going to be a company that's going to come into existence and if it doesn't exist now, where you're going to be able to shoot out text the same way that I shoot out emails. So yeah, definitely. And with your Google voice, you can do a lot. Uh, Betty. I have some new with tag jeans priced at 50 bucks. Should I just knock 50% on or, or $10 a pair of their pack sun bullhead jeans? I can't say. You got to do your research. I mean, if you can get 50 for it, get it. But if they're not selling, yeah, you'll definitely have to discount. Uh, Definitely. Okay, it's 457. I'm not trying to keep y'all here longer. Uh, probably the last leg, it will be longer. Just letting you know that. All right. I want to say thanks to everyone that came out. I appreciate your uh, participation. And uh, there's going to be even more fun stuff in the next session. All right. This is Glendon, and I'll see you on the good side. Do, 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 do.